I graduated from high school Mar May 25th, 1951. And I was in college about four days later at Prairie View a and &M. I'd gotten a scholarship. And I think the scholarship was like, I don't know, $54 or some other small amount. But it was a scholarship. I finished second in the class to Frank. To Frank Crawford? To so Frank Crawford. Yes, yes. Uh, and most of us were going to Prairie View. All of my sisters went to Texas College in Tyler, Texas. My mother paid for them using her money earned or as a maid and my uncles contributed. So my sisters, Gwen and Baby Dell, Baby Dell graduated and went on to become a teacher and she was a teacher in San Diego. She retired as a teacher in San Diego here. Gwen retired as a teacher and vice principal in, in, uh, in uh, Dallas, Texas. So my sisters would, had been given the resources to do an education. I was sent to this Prairie View A&M College would and you tell the viewers what Prairie? Prairie View A&M okay, is, is a, it's called Agricultural and Mechanical. Was That's what it was on. It was a state-supported school. An African-American? A&M, African-American, just outside of Houston in Hempstead, Texas. And they had the worst set of rules ever. You couldn't walk on the same sidewalk after dark that females were on. You sat at a table where it, food was served family style. And I was at a table where there were eight people at the table, seven football players, and me. And these football players passed, played around, and there was nothing ever by the time it got to me or was so microscopic. Well, I had always been fairly outspoken. I'd been in the school play, I'd been the most uh, uh, person that uh, the teachers asked to make presentations. I did the same for the church, for the Easter program, and what have you. And so I was naturally open on my dialogue. And I figured out the other two or three people in the first week or so that I was there at Prairie View for more like a training program than real school, that we were going to starve to death if we didn't let the school know that there was a problem food-wise. Well, you do not do that at black schools in the South, or at least you didn't at that time. I was back home. Like that. I mean, like that. So I never even got a chance to fully enroll or none of the above. I never got a chance to use a scholarship. My mother was humiliated. Embarrassed tears at this promising son of hers who went off to college. His other colleagues from his class went to college, and he couldn't even stay for the early development particularly since the school you had to raise your own food, raise the food that the school served in many cases, et cetera. Everybody had to work. Well, so I couldn't go back to Mineola. That's where I lived. And that would have been bad, embarrassing. She had me come to Dallas with my uncle Richard and his wife and over in South Dallas. And she immediately used her influence with her white people to get me a job. I got a job in Founders Library. I worked on the campus of SMU the, the summer of 1951. My uncle heard about my absence from Prairie View and absolutely was delighted. He communicated with my mother, convinced her, who had never been to California, that this was the place that he was running an incredible business that he could use me in. He just lied through his teeth. Which uncle? It's he. It's he. Okay. It's he. It's okay. he. he lied through his teeth that I could live with him and uh, you know, it would be a perfect life, etc. And my mother fell for it. I got a ticket on the TNP train. I had a wood, uh, a, a cardboard suitcase. In those days, <laughs> suitcases were not like they are today. There was no Samsonite. You got a few. It looked good, too. It looked, but it was a, it was a suitcase. If it got wet, you were in trouble. And my mother fixed this great shoebox of chicken because you couldn't eat on the train. And your train would take, like, I guess, a day and a half or two days or whatever it took to get to California. I came by train alone.
Yeah, because yes, you're black. Yes, okay, go ahead. I came by train alone to San Francisco. With a small box of chicken. Yes. Oh, well, not much chicken left when <laughs> I got here. But except on the train, all the people working on the train were black. You know, the porters and the, and the, and the stewards and the, and the waiters on the train, because that's some of what my uncle had done. I mean, my, my father had done. So seeing this little 17-year-old black kid with this suitcase made out of, you know, cardboard and this box of shoebox of chicken, they kind of took up and looked out for me. And so I got a lot of assistance on the way out here from the cats on the train. But when I got here, I didn't land in San Francisco. I didn't know, and I don't think my mother knew, but the train goes to Oakland. Oh, you no. get off, yeah, you got off the train in Oakland and you go by bus. I could not believe what I saw. I thought every street was a bridge <laughs> because the first thing I got with lights was the Bay Bridge. When the bus came across the Bay Bridge that night, uh, I didn't really have any appreciation that it was the Bay Bridge, but I came across the bus on the Bay Bridge and all these lights were one after another and then all the streets had lights and they were uphill and downhill so I am absolutely blown away that I'm in a city with nothing but bridges. <laughs> My uncle of course met me at the, at, the, at the bus station where I was dropped and took me to his place at 1028 Oak Street and uh, put, stashed me in a room, he had an extra room there uh, his wife, Ruby, whom he had brought from Texas with him, uh, they had a son named, um, she had a previous son, not my uncle's uh, uh, child, uh, whose name was Willie as well, uh, and uh, we called him Sugar. Uh, Same age as you? No, no, he was about oh, maybe two or three years older and a great football player. Uh, and he had, uh, uh, he was out here and he may have been living with another uncle of hers, a brother of hers or something. Anyway, so there was somebody to at least for me to relate to.